There are absolutely loads of new Barnakai revealed in Bleach's final arc, the Thousand Year Blood War arc. In fact, I think my video looking at all Barnkai in the source material revealed that the Quincy Blood War has in fact the most new Barnkai of any arc, which I think is pretty fitting for a big world-ending battle. And of these Barnkai, I think most, if not all, are genuinely great from multiple perspectives, be it their designs, their reveals, their impact. There's a lot of winners here. However, of all the Barnkai reveals in the Thousand Year Blood War, one in particular has always stood out to me as being a perfect storm of fan anticipation and expectation, visual magnificence, and actually delivering on the impact you'd expect from a Barnkai, that being Rukia Kuchki's Hacker No Togame. And so in this video, I want to take a look at Rukia's ice-cold Bankai that harnesses and wields Sode no Shiryuki's true power and shows us just what the most beautiful blade in the Soul Society can actually do, even if it's only for a fleeting moment. Before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support me and the channel. And if you want to take that support for me another step further, I do also have a Patreon as well. And as always, I want to give a massive shout out and just say a huge thank you to everyone that does support me over there on Patreon currently. I really do appreciate each and every one of you. And just another quick word before we begin, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone from the last video who went and checked out my second channel, Mr. Tomo Talks Games. I really do appreciate it, and it was really encouraging seeing so many of you going over there, checking out the videos that are on offer, and I'm really looking forward to making more. So if you are interested in that and you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, again, I will leave the links down in the description and potentially the pinned comment below. So yeah, if you do fancy checking that out, I really would appreciate it. And again, a massive thank you to everyone that already has. And lastly, in case you somehow clicked on this video without realising, there will be spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War arc of Bleach to come. In my opinion, everything about Rukia's Bankai is a big success, and that success begins with the journey taken to get there. As the deuteragonist for much of Bleach, particularly the first half, it felt like the entire collective community wanted to see Rukia attain Bankai by the story's end. After all, for Shinigami characters, this feels like the ultimate developmental milestone, a capstone to whatever journey they've been on until now. So, this reveal was hugely anticipated, somewhat expected, and was always going to be celebrated. But the celebration of this Bankai reveal goes even deeper than that. There are very few characters, at least in my opinion, as deserving of acquiring that final stage of a Zanpakuto than Rukia. As readers, we've witnessed the many trials and tribulations this character has undergone over the years, and there's no better portrayal of officer growth within the Gotei 13 than Rukia herself. We see Rukia's earliest days out of the academy as she's assigned an unseated position within the 13th division. We believe that sense of crushing failure and inadequacy she feels when faced with her own brother's apparent callous disappointment in her lack of skill, and we see her taking an active role in the battle against the Arankar, even being the first to kill an Espada after an emotional struggle that leaves her near death. And then, after restoring Ichigo's powers, we see Rukia has, at last, been given a well-deserved promotion, leapfrogging all the way from an unseated officer to the vice-captain of her division, and rightly so. There's a strange sense of pride, I think, in seeing Rukia achieving her goals after all this time. When it comes to Ichigo, he's already a special being before the story even gets rolling. As the main character, there's never any doubt that he's going to progress, to wield new strength and use it to defeat powerful foes. And while I like Ichigo a lot, and he crucially absolutely puts in the work, most of what's special about his powers and abilities can be traced back to his blood, to his heritage and hybrid status. He just needs to unlock it. 
That's the benefit of being the protagonist, after all. So in the shadow of Ichigo, Rukia feels somewhat like an underdog, and her consistent successes across the entire Bleach storyline are wonderful to see. Of course, this journey of hers all comes to a head in the Thousand Year Blood War arc. With Byakia's evisceration at the hands of the Sternritter as not all eyes fell to Rukia come the second invasion, as we expected these two characters to come face to face, and for her to exact some kind of justice or vengeance for her normally prideful brother. As not therefore represents the ultimate final challenge for Rukia. Not only is he a powerful enemy in his own right with a terrifying ability, but he defeated Byakia. Her brother's, her family's honour is on the line here, but more than anything else, this is her moment. A chance to show she can stand side by side with Byakia after all this time. Although she finds herself overwhelmed by Asnot in the end, she puts up an admirable fight, forcing her opponent into a corner with the true power of her Sode no Shiryuki. But when Byakia arrives on the battlefield and saves her life, he does so without snatching away her hard-fought victory. Instead, he reveals what she's waited to hear her entire life, that he finally recognises her power. With that knowledge stealing her mind, Rukia releases her Bankai hacker no Togame and destroys her brother's spectre once and for all. It's a truly beautiful moment, not least because the Bankai itself is a genuine visual spectacle, but because Rukia's character comes full circle at last. So why does Rukia's journey as a Shinigami matter when discussing her Bankai? Because unlike most other Bankai users, the majority of whom have had Bankai since before we first met them, we see Rukia rise through the ranks in real time, effectively, and that makes it all the more potent when she reveals her true strength at the journey's natural end. It's an oddly prideful moment, as I mentioned earlier, from the perspective of the reader, and a big aspect of why I think her Bankai is such a success all round on Kubo's part. But let's dive into the Bankai itself, what it can do, its visuals, and how it's used by Kubo. Interestingly, Haka no Togame only really exists thanks to the true nature of Sode no Shiryuki, something Rukia only attunes with after her training in the Royal Palace. What I mean by that is the ultimate ability of Rukia's Bankai is only tangentially related to everything else we've seen her perform in Shikai up until this fight. Instead, it's a realisation of her Zanpakuto's true power that would be revealed in her battle against Asnot. In both the Arankar and Lost Agent arcs, Rukia's Zanpakuto was firmly a fairly standard ice-type Zanpakuto, albeit with a crystalline and snow-white beauty to it. She had the ability to perform a multitude of different dances, each with their own unique ability. With her first dance, Tsukishiro, Rukia draws a brilliant white circle on the ground with the tip of her blade. Everything within and above the circle begins to freeze, creating effectively an inescapable column of ice. The next dance, Hakuden, sees Rukia piercing the ground in front of her numerous times before drawing an icy essence from those very cuts. The ice gathers on her blade before she thrusts it forwards in an enormous wave. These are just two examples of her sword's power, but we can see the theme isn't overtly too indifferent from other prominent ice-type Zanpakuto wielders namely Hitsugaya, basically, except Rukia's powers are considerably more elegant, with an emphasis on fluidity of motion and spectacle. However, upon returning from the royal palace, Rukia reveals that the true power of Sode no Shiryuki doesn't lie in ice at all, but in cold. And this is honestly really cool and quite unique, I think. Rukia's powers actually revolve around frigid cold and plunging temperatures, with her Shikai allowing her to control the temperature of her own body. We see in her battle against Asnot that she's unable to utilise this ability at the very start of a fight, as she mentions having to avoid his arrows until that moment came. 
But having successfully lowered the temperature of her own body to the point where she's biologically dead, Rukia is able to freely catch and handle Asnot's thorns without fear, even being able to freeze them completely with her bare hand. Rukia reveals that her Zanpakuto's power was never simply to spread coldness from its blade, but to lower the temperature of its wielder's body eventually below zero. At this point, Rukia can now freeze anything by touching it as her internal temperature continues to plummet, and her blade is now but an extension of her arm with no real special abilities of its own in this moment. As Rukia continues to lower her body temperature and overpower as not, she eventually reaches the point of absolute zero, encasing him entirely within an icy prison in a shot that looks very cinematic and very awesome. The true nature of Sode no Shiryuki is very strong but also tricky to wield. The closer Rukia takes herself to absolute zero in Shikai, the closer she comes to shattering her own body. Once she's bested her opponent, she has to then slowly reverse the effect, it's not an instant change, warming herself back up again. We see that in this state, by overextending herself by a fraction of a second, she sustains a wound on her thumb. So then, this, what we witness here, is the true power of Sode no Shiryuki, and it's from this ability that her Bankai, Haka no Togame, is born. Had Kubo given her a Bankai back in the Arankar arc, I'm left wondering what form it would have taken. Perhaps it would have been an incomplete or untrue Bankai in the same vein as, say, Renji's Hihio Zabimaru. Rukia adopts her own unique stance, lifting her blade horizontally beside her head before activating her Bankai. The moment she speaks the words, her hair and eyes begin to change, the colour quickly draining out of them as though bleached by a blinding flash of white. Haka no Togame, meaning white mist punishment, feels like Rukia is passing judgment on Asno. The activation of Rukia's Bankai is akin to her preparing to dole out a final sentence to her foe. While it's unclear exactly what follows in this moment, a massive, all-encompassing, angelic white glow illuminates the entire battlefield in a flash. We see the light washing through the numerous alleyways, capped off by a huge disk of light that sits high above the epicentre of the activation, Rukia herself. When the dust clears, we see poor old Asnot has been completely frozen again, this time to his very core. It certainly looked like the last time Rukia froze him when she was using her absolute zero state, she only managed to succeed his surface layer, which is why he kind of broke out of it in a kind of gruesome fashion, tearing the ice away from his very skin. But here, it has gone right through to the bone and even deeper than that. But not only that, the top half of his head has been cleanly sliced off. As his body fractures and splits, crumbling into pieces, we see a silhouette in the distance emerging from the wintry fog. And there, standing tall, is Rukia, in all the splendour of her fantastic Bankai, a striking queen of the cold and frost, adorned even with a crown of icicles. But we'll gush over the visuals in a moment. While it's difficult to say for sure, considering what happened to Asnot's head and the fact that the position of Rukia's sword has changed between her activating the Bankai and during the Bankai itself, it seems very likely to me that the activation of Hakano Togame includes one final swing of the sword at her enemy. I think there's more to it than just being a huge wave of cold, capable of freezing even a Sternritter in its ultimate form, down to nothing more than a brittle twig. But for now, that's what we have. It's incredible to think what the toll on her body must be. During the initial stages of this fight, we see her both working up to being able to use her Zanpakuto's true power, and then watch as she slowly lowers her temperature over time. Even after that, she has to then gradually raise it again. Here, though, Rukia presumably transitions from her warm-bodied self, as we don't see her trying to reach her state of absolute zero again once Asnot activates his holy form, down to a completely frozen version of herself in an instant. It's no wonder Byakia believes Rukia's Bankai is not only powerful, 
but incredibly dangerous to use. Even before moving from her stance, Rukia nearly loses her entire hand as she grips her Zanpak toe, causing her flesh to crack like a ceramic vase. But with Byakia's guidance and a few deep breaths, Rukia is able to very gingerly, very carefully, ease herself back out of her Bankai. She allows her body to heat up, though simply by touching her hand in this form, Byakia's fingers begin to frost over. As Rukia's icy crown shatters and her hair begins to turn back to black, the Bankai slowly melts away. And that's essentially what Rukia's Bankai Hakano Togame does, and how Kubo chose to portray it, chose to depict it within the story, but let's talk about those visuals, because this is a truly splendid Bankai. The visuals on display here are another reason why I think this is such a great reveal, and an overall success of a Bankai. I said earlier that Rukia's Bankai is a genuine spectacle, and I mean it. Hakano Togame might just be one of my favourite designs uh, from the entire series. Sode no Shiryuki is believed to be the most beautiful Zanpakuto in Soul Society, and I'd say that translates to her Bankai too. Hakano Togame transforms Rukia completely into a regal winter queen, draping her in an ornate pearly white gown and bestowing her with a glittering headpiece. Her huge winding collar and shoulder pieces add to the overall extravagance of the image, and the ribbons extending from her back like the wings of a butterfly return that elegance to her from her Shikai. Speaking of those ribbons, though the ribbon from the Zanpakuto's hilt has seemingly gone, it's like Rukia herself has become an embodiment of what Sode no Shiryuki represented. Even her face has this strangely vacant, almost doll-like quality to it, like she's become a pristine being of perfect quality, which of course plays well into the idea that she's also become incredibly fragile. One misstep and she'll shatter into a thousand pieces. In this form, her design is taking direct inspiration from the yokai of Japanese folklore, Yuki Onna, from which the anime version of Sode no Shiryuki's spirit also called back to. Yuki Onna was said to have a deathly pale beauty to her, and to be so cold and white that she blended into the snowy landscape surrounding her. Even the power of Rukia's Bankai, that of passing judgement on her enemies with a pure pale white sentence of death, harkens back to the Yuki Onna, who despite being serene and beautiful, was also completely ruthless. In this form, her blade has become almost totally transparent, which is a really great detail, and again, calls back to that idea of this yokai who blended into her surroundings. It feels like this Bankai reveal is also an obvious parallel of Ichigo's in the Soul Society as well, from the Bankai being obscured by smoke to begin with, to the nature of the transformation itself, with both wielders being draped in a new flowing outfit, Ichigo's being a pitch black, and Rukia's being a snow white. And considering, of course, at the very start of this story they were effectively deuteragonists, although that does subside over time, them sharing this reflection, this parallel, does feel very fitting. So the visuals of Hakano Togame are also a massive triumph for Kubo, because this Bankai is so totally and utterly memorable. And that's exactly what you want from a Bankai reveal, particularly for a major character like Rukia, and particularly when it's her first time using it. I honestly cannot wait to see this adapted into the anime. There's a few reasons why Rukia vs. Asnod is one of the most hotly anticipated fights of this upcoming part, and this is probably top of the pack for most people maybe vying with the Kenpachi vs. Gremi battle. Personally, I've been saying this for years now, but I still hope they use the track Nightmare for the moment Byakia turns his back on Asnot after all this time. And so that's basically it for Rukia's stunning Bankai, Hacker no Togame. In my opinion, Kubo did virtually everything right with this reveal, showcasing the Bankai in all its glory, showing its strengths, its weaknesses, and all within the space of a few pages, essentially. But perhaps best of all, it feels like the culmination of a hard-fought and well-worn journey that Rukia has carved out for herself throughout the story, and I couldn't be happier 
with its depiction. But that's it for the video guys, let me know in the comments below what do you think of Rukia's Bankai Hacker no Togame, how powerful do you think this thing actually is, and are you excited to see this Bankai reveal and this fight in the upcoming anime? I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. Guys, make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't done already. Go and check out Mr. Tomo Talks Games to support me over there. But until next time guys, I'll catch you later, and I'll see you then.